uh, panel was uh, completely organized between Velux Fonden, Mary Foundation, and also between the Centre Scientifique de Monaco. It has been part of the effort that those three institutions have run from the beginning of the year in order to put uh, or yeah to discuss about the shipping and the triple crisis and to have conclusions in terms of governance, economy, uh, social dimension, and technological dimension. We then continue the discussions in Malmo University in May, and we are continuing. We are going to continue with this, obviously. So as you know, shipping has a significant and growing, growing impact on marine ecosystem, both in terms of climate and biodiversity, including underwater radiated noise and the discharge of seaway, seaway and grey water containing bacteria, microplastic, pollutants and pathogens into the world's oceans. At the same time, more than 90% of world trade is carried by the international shipping. Without it, the import and export of goods on the scale need to sustain today's global economy wouldn't be possible. This explains why the number of ships in the world is increasing, as if the pollution of the marine environment by ship generating waste. In line with the Paris, Paris Agreement on Climate, the International Maritime Organization has set target to reduce carbon emission from shipping by 30% by 2030 and to zero by 2050 and to reduce the speed of the world's fleet to reduce underwater noise and collision with whales and dolphins. While the amount of time ships spent in port has been decreasing over the years, the introduction of COVID-19 has reversed this progress. The main challenges for the maritime and port industries is to manage and transformation process toward decarbonization while maintaining economic growth. Finding the balance between environmental sustainability, regulatory compliance, and economic needs is essential for a prosperous, equitable, and resilient maritime and port sector in the future to ensure that the 2030 goals are met. I'm going to start, and I'm very pleased to start, this panel with Valerie Hickey, who is the Global Director of Environment Party Department of the World Bank. Prior to that, she was a manager for advisory and operations in the climate change group, where she oversaw the implementation of the World Bank's commitment on climate change, climate mainstreaming, and climate finance, and before that, the practice manager for ENV in Latin America and in the Caribbean, where she managed a growth sectoral team that support countries and communities on issues related to climate change, sustainable forest management, integrated conservation and development, integrated coastal zone management, fishery, pollution management and environmental health, environmental economics, and environmental risk management. Valerie, you're very welcome. Thank you so much, Patricia, and thank you for that very kind introduction where you heard nowhere about shipping. And so I'm probably the least valuable person on this panel, but I wanted to share some ideas that we at the World Bank have really been thinking about because we cannot fight the biodiversity crisis or the climate crisis or the poverty crisis and the debt crisis and the food security crisis and every other crisis without shipping. And we do have a huge opportunity with shipping and it's the fact that it has a single regulatory framework under the IMO. There's very few other sectors that are managed in such a centralized way. So there's an opportunity, a decision point to influence. But then there are two challenges. The first is that ships are long lasting assets. Once you build a ship, it's going to be around for many decades. So we need to start acting now because the new generation of ships that are coming online, we're going to be living with their downsides if they have any for the next 30, 40 years past 2050. So if we're going to meet the IMO's ambition, we have to help them to transition their equipment, their infrastructure now. The second challenge, and this is one that we take very seriously at the World Bank, is because, as Patricia said, over 80% 80, 80 of logistical supply chains are supplied through shipping. Anything that happens to shipping is felt at the local grocery store, particularly in small islands, particularly in poor countries that import a lot because they don't have their own industry, they don't have enough food security. That means in a world where already 750 million people are struggling to put food on the table and are highly food insecure, any changes in shipping risks further exacerbating existing affordability and cost of living crises. So this may be a discussion about shipping, but really it's a discussion about everything else we talk about. 
So every one of these cops, I was in Colombia a few weeks ago, here now, we really are talking about how do we raise ambition? Job done at the IMO, because as Patricia said, they want to become, they want to decarbonize by 2050, so the ambition is there. But then how do you accelerate action? And this is where the challenge is. And in shipping, there's a challenge of supply and demand. And of course, there's a challenge of money. In terms of supply, in order to decarbonize, basically shipping is going to have to move to green fuels. I think we all agree with that. And it's going to be some sort of green hydrogen-based fuels, whether it's methane or ammonia, you, you name it, experts will know better. But it's currently simply not cost competitive. It's four to six times the price to develop and produce these fuels than traditional fuels. That means it's totally unbankable. Nobody in their right mind is going to invest in a type of fuel that is simply going to cost way more than they're going to get a return on their investment. So the supply is a problem. When we did a little bit of work looking at the numbers, we think it's going to cost anywhere from 10 to $40 billion a year to subsidize the fact that this is not yet an investable proposition. The private sector isn't going to come in and pick this up yet. So we, we need to de-risk it. That means providing credit enhancement. It means doing specific risk guarantee uh, proposals. It means going in and doing um, co-investing to the tune of 10 to $40 billion a year. Where's that money going to come from? Who has that amount of money readily available? All right. So that's one question that has to be solved. The second question right now is lagging demand because it is so expensive to produce, the price to buy it, it would have to be equally expensive. So there is lagging demand and that's where the opportunity in shipping comes in. Because shipping is managed through the IMO and because the IMO has this really ambitious agenda to go green by 2050, that's where demand is gonna come from. And that's exciting but it's figuring out how to make that demand work and how to do it without creating artificial move to green energy as when it stays this expensive, which means simply the cost will be put through to the consumer and we're gonna exacerbate food security. We're gonna exacerbate the debt crisis in small islands. We're gonna make some small islands unlivable because simply the prices won't work. They can't import anymore. So the demand is there on paper, but how do we realize it? in practice when the supply of green fuels continues to be not cost competitive. And then one of the things we've thought about in terms of matching supply and demand and making sure we can provide that subsidy is of course the carbon markets. It's something we all discuss in this space and there is a lot of discussion and the IMO is looking at developing um, an emissions trading scheme, a carbon price. And it could in theory generate a lot of money if a carbon price was put on shipping, though again, who, who is going to pay? It's not just the small islands, it's not just you and me who sit and buy things that are imported and would have to pay at that price point if the fuel is expensive. It's also if there's an added carbon tax, that's going to be passed through to the consumer. And then where does that money go? If there is a fuel tax, who collects it? How do we make sure it is used exactly to subsidize green fuels as long as they're not cost competitive. So there are plumbing problems in terms of moving money, even if a carbon price, even if that carbon price was paid and collected, how is it going to be distributed? So there still are lots of questions. And that's what I'm excited to hear from this panel is really to learn more about how do we accelerate action to realize this big ambition in the shipping center when we have problems in supply we have regulatory demand, but in real life it's lagging. We have fears about what that mismatch in terms of price competitiveness will do to the end consumer who has to use shipping and is every one of us affected in every way. And we're excited in some ways about the potential for a carbon tax and for carbon pricing, but the questions of who pays and who benefits and where the money goes remain critical and that's why we've been so engaged in this sector and doing more in the last few years because the other thing we really want to make sure is that as shipping decarbonizes the benefits don't just accrue in the global north the traditional homes of big shipping 
but that we can decentralize and we can send to the global south and have them take advantage not just of being, becoming producers of green energy, but becoming some of the places where that green energy infrastructure is available for maritime transport and where they can become champions of maritime transport as well. Thanks, Patricia. Thank you very much for this context. It was really important for us, and I think it's maybe the reason why we decided to start with you, to have uh, those inputs considering what we already discussed uh, during the year. Now I'm going to give the floor to Francisca Cortez Solari, our executive president of Philanthropy Cortez Solari. Francisca is an entrepreneur, environmentalist, and philanthropist who has dedicated her life to integral and sustainable development initiatives in Chile and around the world. With an extensive personal and family background in the world of design and retail, in 2002 she founded Philanthropy Cortez Solari, a philanthropic project that promotes integrated sustainable development through integral education, climate change mitigation, and biodiversity conservation. For more than 20 years, Philanthropy has been working on integral education program focused on the educational community in Chile and Latin America with an experiential character and in connection with nature, reaching more than 7,000 young people and teachers each year. Uh, Francisca has been an outstanding promoter of climate change mitigation and biodiversity conservation in Latin America from 2024. She's a new member of USN, 15 Painters of Nature, that bring together the world's leading conservation leaders to mobilize resource and technical capacity and threaten USN's management and vision for conservation. Francisca, I give you the floor. Are you too? Muchas gracias. So thank you very much. Se escucha, ¿no es cierto? Sí. Muchas gracias. Eh, mi rol aquí en esta, en este lugar tiene que ver con la filantropía, place, eh, really la, en la función y el valor que hoy día toma eh, mayormente los fondos privados y no solamente la responsabilidad social empresarial, sino la filantropía como un acto eh, colectivo que eh, debería estar básicamente como algo dentro de nuestros valores o nuestro entendimiento. And the role that the philanthropy has in the understanding and the feeling for the rest, not only for the social uh, responsibility. Desde un principio, eh, nosotros, eh, nuestra, nuestro, nuestra meta ha sido poder conservar tres territorios en Chile donde uno de ellos nos dio la oportunidad de trabajar en los océanos. From the very beginning, we started to work in three territories in Chile. One of them allowed us to work in the ocean. The fact that we were able to work in the ocean, see what are the Chilean needs, especially when we're talking about the Chilean Patagonia, which is a very special place in terms of conservation at a world level, and also a potential for other needs for the world. So the fact to be able to study the Patagonia and to understand what were the first necessities there and the potential es, to the rest of the world also. Es ahí donde eh, nosotros, eh, aparte de hacer conservación efectiva en un territorio, también eh, pudimos ver cuáles eran las problemáticas que habían en cuanto a tráfico marino en la zona, que finalmente era una de las amenazas más grandes que teníamos en la zona del Corcovado, Por lo tanto, como filantropía decidimos y nos metimos en esa línea. So when we started to study the Patagonia, we understood very quickly that one of the main problems was the migrated traffic in the Corcovado, the very north of the Patagonia. Porque justamente no, no, nos metemos donde tenemos la necesidad. Entonces, eh, hicimos ciencia, pero al mismo tiempo de poder hacer ciencia y sacar algunos proyectos que fueron emblemáticos, como la Blue Boat Initiative, eh, un proyecto tecnológico, innovador, que igual eh, impacta en el fondo eh, la posibilidad de ir creciendo también en la tecnología. So because of the need of study the maritime traffic, we started to do science with very emblematic project as for example, the Blue Boat Initiative, a very high-tech project where we try to 
protect the whales. Gracias, gracias. De ahí tomamos como todas las necesidades territoriales y mm, nos atrevimos a hacer una inversión de, un, eh, de una embarcación eh, que se demoró cuatro años en hacer. Es un proyecto que viene desde siete años atrás. At the same time, and beside the Global GD initiative which, that was trying to protect the whales, we decided to work on the ship. Todo lo que tenía que ver con este nuevo paradigma, con este nuevo eh, eh, cambio de hacer que las embarcaciones fueran sostenibles. We try to develop a kind of pilot or prototype with all of the new technology Al in order to make it a sustainable one. Claro, al principio era como un sueño personal y siempre me ha gustado pensar en la naturaleza, por lo tanto, en esa embarcación nosotros le pusimos todo lo que hicimos como una trazibilidad. So at first it, it was like a personal dream how to develop this prototype of ship very sustainable, very very traceable. Esa embarcación eh, hoy ganó eh, hace unos días, hace unos meses atrás ganó un premio como la embarcación más sostenible eh, del mundo. And a few months ago, this uh, shift named Cachalote win uh, the most sustainable. Uh, es una embarcación pequeña, yeah, pero no enseñó mucho para hacer también y poder participar en todas las mesas de trabajo de océano. So that shift wins an award. Win an award <laughs> has the most sustainable uh, shift in the world with the latest, latest technology and with the certification also yes. of uh, the less contamination in terms of carbon of the oxide Entonces, of carbon. Claro, ¿cuál es la importancia de la filantropía o de los recursos privados? Yo realmente cuando empezamos este sueño no sabíamos si el barco se iba a hundir. Yeah, when we started to develop the shift, and that's true, we didn't know if it was fue algo possible super or nuevo. not. It was something fue completely fue new. Fuimos los primeros en ponerle paneles solares. We were the first that put at that time de, solar eh, panel de in the fuera shift. Lo más sostenible posible y, y fue super exitoso el resultado. Yeah, and it was a very successful result. Can I add it that en you join technology from Netherlands together with all the old traditions from South America. Yes. Y hoy en día eh, este proyecto, como como dice Pat eh, es un proyecto que reúne, que enseñó a la cultura en el territorio. It's a project that allows us to learn and, and to recover also. Claro, the culture, como que volver de nuevo la construcción eh, como más originaria que tenía que ver con obviamente con vela y con It was a possibility con un mix to también que hicimos. The old traditions way to build the shift. Eh, y también perfeccionamos a los equipos dentro de la isla. And to teach them those team es decir, the en un proyecto, eh, en realidad podemos, pudimos hacer muchas cosas en conjunto, eh, po poder eh, colaborar con eh, las comunidades, sacar un producto so, uh, a nivel internacional y lo otro que eh, hoy en día podemos entender en realidad en un, en un objeto real eh, cuáles son las, las reales eh, desafíos que tiene la navegación. Well estamos seguros que es un, proyecto, es un proyecto pequeño, pero estamos seguros, seguros que también project, es el comienzo de empezar a buscar también maneras de navegar, por lo menos tal vez más privadamente, una navegación más sostenible, porque también es difícil ver la parte de la industria. Pero por lo menos en la parte más, eh, tal vez, eh, dimensiones más pequeñas, sí se puede encontrar la sostenibilidad en embarcaciones más pequeñas por su rendimiento. Gracias. Thank you very much, Francisca. It's a very beautiful project. I, I love it. Oh my God. <laughs> so now I'm going to give the floor to Simon Wamsley, uh, who is Senior Director for Oceans and Climate. Uh, previously, uh, previously, Simon worked at the World Wide Fall Fund for over 25 years, during which time he helped uh, Karen. Karen. Karen, we can hear Karen. the tradition. Yes, previously Simon worked at the WWF over 25 years, during which time he held a number of senior positions, including head of the WWF UK Marine Program, chief marine advisor at the WWF 
UK Senior Advisor on Sustainable Development from for the WWF International Arctic Program and Marine Manager at WWF International, specializing in ocean governance, climate extractive industries and shipping. Prior to WWF, he worked at the British Antarctic Survey, the Institute of Coastal and Estuarine Studies, Department of Environment, Food and Rural Affairs in the UK, and at the University of the West Indies. Simon is a charter scientist, charter marine scientist, fellow of EMRS and associate member of EMA. He earned his PhD at Hull University in Marine Biomonitoring and Ecotoxicology, where his research focuses on biomonitoring tools such as indicator species and heat genetic and the genetic of pollutant tolerant marine population. Simon, can you hear us? I can hear you perfectly well, thank you. Can you hear me? Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Wonderful. Okay, I, I will kick off then. It, it'd be great if I could see my uh, my slides though, which I can't at the moment. Uh, uh, let let check. Jasmine, can you help us with? Uh, Perfect. M m m that's it. Perfect. Thank you very much. So, thank you everyone, and thank you for the introduction, Patricia. Uh, very very nice, and, and m m many words in that introduction. I apologise for that. So it's my pleasure to be on this panel, Shipping and Climate, addressing the Triple Challenge. So next, next slide, please. So for, for this presentation, for the purpose of this presentation, I, I'll define the Triple Challenge as in the paper attached. I, I thought it would be rude not to, as I was a co-author on this paper. So to paraphrase the abstract, we, we face a Triple Challenge, averting dangerous climate change, reversing biodiversity loss, and supporting the well-being of a growing global population. Action to address each of these issues is inherently dependent on addressing the other ones. So responses here need to maximise synergies and minimise trade-offs. We've already heard things ar ar around that. But it, it's, it's, the, it's the, the through management of biomes, it's management of land and waters as well. So we're considering this as a, an ecosystem holistic approach in terms of climate mitigation, biodiversity protection, restoration, of course human well-being and humans are of course a significant part of the ecosystem. So, so what I'm going to actually try to do today is make this relevant in a shipping context. I'll discuss the use of existing tools, initiatives that may help to deliver some of this, but hopefully at least provide food for thought. Next slide please. So, as, as we leverage this requirement to urgently reduce greenhouse gas emissions, we also need to address the impact of shipping in other areas. Some of them have already been mentioned, marine mammal strikes, underwater noise, the translocation of alien species, for instance, is a, is, is a real issue through ballast water and through, for example, hull fouling. And these connections are very rarely explored together and have not yet efficiently been coordinated with the urgent transition to zero emission shipping. So this is a great opportunity. It's a great opportunity as we re redesign the fleet and its operations for this, this car these carbon issues, we can also look at co-benefits these other issues with hopefully little or no additional cost and importantly all these things could be fixable on a technical level but they also require political commitment and that leads me on to my next slide please uh, we've already heard mention of, of the International Maritime Organization of course that the, the global shipping regulator for the international fleet the shipping's international fleet uh, Again, you can see some photographs here. I, I, I always like to describe things via, via pictures, the, the exciting negotiations at IMO. So I, IMO is a UN specialized body based in London, and IMO and its member states really has the power to make this change. It literally writes the rule book for the whole of the global shipping international fleet. And political commitment here often means legally binding regulations. And IMO has been doing this for over 50 years in areas of security, safety, and environment so obviously it's, it's got a track record next slide please so th this this is a photograph taken by a colleague of mine as he was coming in to the Panama Canal and, and this is quite a common sight this is ships idling basically they can sit there for days or, or even weeks waiting for their slot to go through the Panama Canal and this is quite a common sight in, in heavily used port areas for example Singapore uh, the English Channel so the next time you're flying over Singapore take, take a look or I'll have a look at night and all you can see is lights. I, I, I see it in, in the UK because I live near Heathrow. It's very similar with the, the aeroplanes. But while, while the ships are doing this, 
they're obviously polluting, they're having emissions, and, and they're also using time, which is a, a great commodity for, for everyone. There, there are many synergistic solutions around efficiency at different scales to help, from port logistics to just-in-time arrivals, and then more technically, things like hull, hull fouling management, hull superstructure, power and propulsion tweaks, and of course, speed and voyage optimization. But how, how do all these also benefit other issues or at least minimize those trade-offs I was talking about earlier? Generally, an efficient ship is a less impacting ship, is a safer ship, and obviously the impact is less on biodiversity as well. Less pollution, less greenhouse gas emissions, less fuel use. Win, win, win. Next slide, please. So looking at things at, at dif different scales, on, on the, the left hand of this slide, we have green shipping corridors. Now, green shipping corridors can fast track the adoption of carbon neutral fuels, which play a critical role in achieving IMO's zero emission targets by 2050. By focusing on specific routes and close collaboration among key stakeholders, and that's key, these corridors can help resolve the barriers to the uptake of new fuels and technologies on this manageable scale. And drawing your attention to the right hand of this slide, this is a, a global map of particularly sensitive sea, sea areas, the, the locations around the planet. Now, particularly sensitive sea areas are a designation under the International Maritime Organization to protect biodiverse areas that are sensitive to shipping activities and impacts. So theoretically, combining these types of tools, strategically and systematically, different scales could be very, very advantageous. Next slide, please. So again, coming, coming back to the original paper that I, I had on the first slide and paraphrasing again, uh, approaching, approaching uh, just an equitable transition, approaches to managing trade-offs that can promote just an equitable transition. In the paper we quote, social and economic policy pivoting towards inclusive wealth. Now, we, we've already heard that the greenhouse gas emission levy under negotiation in, in the IMO uh, if, if the revenue disbursement is, is used correctly, then th this could cover some of this. And, and, and that's a, a good discussion to have and, uh, be had and part of the negotiations in the IMO at the moment. But we really also need more integrated policy making across these three areas, uh, not at all, all scales as well. And triple challenge dialogues among states and non-state actors. And of course, I include competent bodies like IMO in this, and of course, bodies like the regional fisheries management organisations. And let me draw your attention to the text on the right there. That's, that's how the IMO relates to the BBNJ, the High Seas Treaty. And it, and it mentions not undermining there. So whatever happens in the, the BBNJ shouldn't undermine what happens in these competent bodies like IMO. But I'm a glass half, half full person. I like to flip this on this head. I think it, it mandates interna enhanced international cooperation. And what we need to do is operationalize this enhanced cooperation on a sector and across sector and on an issue base. And for example, we can use EBSAs, ecologically, biologically significant areas, which are a, a CBD scientific description. Uh, and, and we can use them with things like particularly sensitive sea areas, routing measures in shipping to provide the sensitivity data. So we, we've got data there from recognized sources, peer reviewed, and it's not reinventing the wheel. I, I'm all in favor of saving time and effort and, and having good data. But again, we need to go further. Every vessel produces a, a voyage plan, which are used to find the most favourable and economic route. They obviously save on greenhouse gas emissions, fuel, help with safety and help with efficiency and, and emissions. But these could also be used for biodiversity protection. In fact, if, if you look at IMO regulations, in Chapter 11 of the Polar Code, there's a mandate to use voyage plans for marine mammal avoidance and other environmental protection. So there's a precedent there and, and already something that's working in that context. This could also be linked to the crew well-being and possibly protection of port communities. So, next slide, please, and I'll just summarise and, and, and finish there. So, in, in terms in terms of, of putting all this together, so we need to maximise synergies and avoid mitigation trade-offs, mitigate and, and trade-off uh, impacts. So we use we can use existing tools and mechanisms in different fora and different scales and design deliver for operational level and this is kind of repurposing and combining existing measures and initiatives and really drawing them down to the operational level and I mentioned efficiency earlier an efficient ship is a less impacting ship is a safer ship 
is a less biodiversity impact in ship, less pollution, less GHGs, less fuel. It's again, win, win, win. And all this should be couched in just an equitable transition. Again, we cannot solve this overnight, but I hope I've provided some food for thought. Thank you very much for listening. Thank you very much, Simon, for this very good presentation and, and map about what is going on and what can we do and improve considering what we already have. I know that Mr. Maxi needs to leave in very few minutes, so I'm just going to jump and give him the floor. Our Secretary of the APCC, you are very welcome. Thank you very much, dear Patricia. Uh, yeah, yes, uh, my intervention, I think, is really well placed because I, we heard, you know, uh, finance perspective. We heard a, an excellent demonstration about uh, concrete philanthropy, you know, going to for the optimization. And now we, we heard the, the, the role of international organization. And this is something which is excellent. So uh, the IPCC sixth assessment report comes with three aspects. We are uh, speaking about triple. Uh, uh, also, the, the conclusion for our sixth assessment coming with the warning, with the hope, and with challenges. And I think this is something which is also applied to the shipping and triple planar, planetary crisis. Our, our report are assessing search and they tried to bring as much as possible th that now knowledge that can allow you know, migration from crisis management to the knowledge risk management. That means we are gaining time and to, to, to take action. So we know that I think uh, we don't need to, uh, to, to repeat because you are already living in a very, very special status where the vigilance should be installed. And I think vigilance should be there. And what we propose at optimization to be aware, to be vigilant for everything is something that can help. Now, uh, uh, looking at the transport sector, our working group three uh, report claim, uh, of climate change did have a chapter 10. I am inviting you to, to visit the chapter 10 of working group three and six ass assessment, and you will have a, an excellent information about the process. Some information like the fact that the transport is contributing by by all, almost 15 percent of the, the, the emission for greenhouse gases. <coughs> so, of course, something how we can tackle this. We can start by reducing the demand to uh, limit emission. Start by uh, reducing the demand, and the reducing demand also is appealing optimization. When optimized, we reduce the, we reduce the demand. So, we can say something: shipping and even aviation are hard to decarbonize. And this is something we should really take in consideration. The hope, the other aspect. I think, as it was explained, not the existing and also what was proposed, like what we proposed Francisca. The hope is there, solution is there. The, possi the possibility to optimize and also to come with something which is really uh, providing all this trajectory that can really uh, converge on something that is less, you know, emitting greenhouse gases, and not only this, even even improving, improving the quality, not only the quality of the sector, but also quality of the business, as you said, highlights the business, the maritime business model that can really bring more, more benefits. So I think the, what is the expect now from, from, from IPCC in coming cycle, seven cycle? I think we are looking to more, to more information. And I think it will be very important to include shipping aspect, transport aspect in our scoping meeting that will be, that will be held in Malaysia. And when we will have the opportunity to assess as much as possible all the new research that can really uh, feed the information that can implement this knowledge risk management in, uh, in shipping process. And with uh, this aspect, I am inviting you, and this is, will be some deliverable from this, uh, this uh, side event, I am inviting all of you, why you are thinking of the optimization, why you are thinking for all challenges, please, Raise paper that should be assessed by the IPCC 
and that will be really approved by governments and that can help implementing all these optimal, effective, efficiency strategies. I can conclude by saying, you are speaking about triple, we should also conclude by 3C. It should be about complementarity, coherence, and also collaboration, because once cannot deliver, together we can deliver. Thank you very much. Mr. Maxit, thank you for coming for your time. By the way, decided to improve my voice. <laughs> Now I want to give the floor to Natalie Hilmi. Natalie is the Sustainable Director of uh, the Centre Scientifique de Monaco. She's an expert in microeconomics and international finance. After doing research and giving lecture at the CEMAFI, University of Nice Sophia, France, she obtained her PhD thesis with honor in 2000. Uh, in 2010, she joined the Centre Scientifique de Monaco as section head of environmental economics and collaborated with EIS Environment Laboratories to initiate correlation studies between environmental science and economics to better evaluate the socio-economic extent of impacts and cost of actions versus inaction with regard to carbon emission. Natalie is a friend. We have been working for many years now through the Blue Ocean Roundtable together in Monaco between Mary Foundation Centre Scientifique de Monaco, and lastly with Volux Fanden. You are very welcome, Nathalie. Thank you, Patricia. Uh, I'm going to present now uh, the, our last Blue Economy Roundtable brochure, and it was about shipping and the triple planetary crisis. I will show you some policy recommendations from each working group. Next slide, please. So the objective of the workshop was to, to work together and uh, to, 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 to have some policy recommendations. Next slide, please. What, first, what is blue economy? Um, blue economy, uh, as a definition, is um, an economy that comprises, comprises a range of economic sector and related policies that together determine whether the use of ocean resources is sustainable. Next slide, please. The shipping industry is uh, impacted by climate change. It can have opportunities like new routes because the ice is melting, for example, in uh, Ant uh, the Arctic and Antarctica. And we have also negative impacts of shipping, and you can see here what's happening in the sea. Next slide, please. The triple planetary crisis refers to the three main interlinked issues that humanity currently faces, climate change, pollution, and biodiversity loss. Each of these issues has its own causes and effects, and each issue needs to be resolved if we are to have a viable future on this planet. Next slide, please. So this workshop uh, had four working groups. Uh, I'm going, as I said, to go through the, the different groups and tell you the main policy recommendations. Next slide, please. The first working group was about scientific and environmental con conclusions. And uh, we, we, we tried to, to understand how to work together. And what we really need is a kind of think tank to scope cross disciplinary scientific questions, including all stakeholders. And we also need indigenous knowledge to improve governance and navigation. Next slide, please. We need to break down the silos across disciplines, apply integrative, inclusive approaches to ambitious cross-disciplinary research with a thorough scoping of the scientific questions to address as a starting point. Next slide, please. This is from the institutional and social uh, working group. Uh, first, we talked about maritime speed reduction and uh, we, we need to develop a mechanism to incentivize companies to adopt new and improved technologies to reduce speed where necessary. And about the maritime trafficking, 
We found out that the UN lacks a dedicated ocean agency and establishing one would be impractical. However, coordination between relevant entities is essential, necessitating effective leadership. Next slide, please. So what it has been proposed is to establish a multidisciplinary working group or task, for task force comprising leaders from various sectors, including the UN Academia, Business, Finance, phila Philanthropy, and Civil Society, to develop concrete responses. Next slide, please. This is from the, the, the Economic Roundtable. Uh, what we need is transdisciplinary studies that could help to create and implement new solutions. Economic research on maritime issues should be supported and government should redesign tax and insurance premiums to support new technologies and support education. The shipping industry should be guided by economic models which use cost benefit analysis, scenario analysis, sensitivity analysis and risk assessment methods. Next slide please. About the financial conclusions, we can say that uh, including maritime emissions under the EU emission trading scheme from January 2024 is a game changer. And collaborative efforts of all stakeholders and risk of uh, uh, apportment across the entire value chain. Next slide, please. About the technological uh, roundtable, we have focused on uh, artificial intelligence and, and blockchain and this is very important to make changes in the shipping industry. Next slide, please. Addressing the challenges posed by climate change, biodiversity loss and pollution requires concerted efforts from both the private and public sector. To promote inventivity and innovative technologies, scientists, researchers, and entrepreneurs need freedom to explore and initiate. Hence, one roundtable participant said the following, which the whole roundtable agreed, the best government is the one that governs the less. Next slide, please. Uh, after our workshop in Monaco, we went to another workshop to in Malmo, in uh, Sweden, and uh, we had some more conclusions. For example, methanol, ammoniac, hydrogen, electricity, and renewables, like wind and solar, tech technol uh, companies and scientific centers should be supported to introduce commercially feasible solutions and projects to the shipping sector. A new regulatory and supervisory organization should be created to provide oversight to the international shipping industry. The new supervisory institution should compromise members from government, private enterprises, academia and NGOs. Next slide, please. And uh, finally, the government should redesign tax and insurance premiums to support the new technologies, as we said already in the Monaco workshop. And government should support education for new jobs and positions. Education should also play an important role and discourage human consumption and encourage protection of the world's natural resources. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Natalie. Just mentioned that um, the Monaco Ocean Week, the Blue Economy Roundtable, was composed of 60 people that were working around those uh, working table. Jean Christophe was part of the, that effort too. And our commitment is to present those results uh, at the EMO. Uh, we understand that countries need to discuss that, at the, I think, in April or June. I don't remember well. So, and there is a huge effort behind in order to coordinate all those efforts and works from different institutions. And now, concerning the same thing, I'm going to give the floor to Charlotte Mogensen, who is the program director for the Ocean Program at Velux Fonden. Charlotte has been working tremendously uh, during all those uh, 
those days working with us very um, proximally, helping us a lot with the concept note. I don't know if Charlotte is here, but I'm going to introduce her. Charlotte Bettina Mongensen, as I said, is the program director for the Ocean Program at Velux Vanden. Charlotte Bettina has a long career as a government official working for the Danish Ministry of Environment and Danish Ministry of Food, Agriculture and Fisheries. Prior to taking up her position as program director at Velux Fonden, she was ocean advisor at the Danish Ministry of Environment, working on international ocean issues and head of a delegation for the Kingdom of Denmark to the Arctic Council Working Group on Protection of the Arctic Marine Environment. Charlotte Bettina Mongensen is the former Deputy Secretary for OSPARA and the Bonn Agreement. And as I said, she's a friend of Mary Foundation and Philanthropy Corte Solari because she has been working with us very closely. So thank you, Charlotte, in advance for all your work during uh, this COP29. And I give you the floor, obviously. Thank you so much, Patricia. And thank you so much to everyone that is participating in the panel. And unfortunately, like our previous panel, uh, where we had e Adrian from the Danish Meteorological Institute, I'm not, I was not able to join you, but I'm definitely joining you online. I think this is really fitting that uh, we have so many uh, expertises or agency within our, our panel. We did also touch about uh, shipping uh, and the triple crisis when we are uh, on the 12th of November had the panel on the role of environmental philanthropy in the triple crisis, as we had the uh, general secretary for IMO there as well, and also the CBD and uh, the, ch the chair of uh, IPCC. So I think we had a lot of different agencies that are involved with the protection or the conservation of the marine environment, but also looking into the, um, the impact uh, of shipping and also regulating the shipping as the as Simon already mentioned within the IMO. Uh, Velux uh, Foundation, uh, like Patricia was saying, uh, works closely with the Mary Foundation and Foundation Code Solari on bringing these uh, discussion on the triple crisis, bringing them to all kind of international meetings in the attempt of uh, agencies across uh, different uh, areas of expertise are working together, but also bringing in funding for the uh, vital science that is needed for us actually to bridge this gap between the three crises. And in that uh, regard, I want to mention that um, we as a foundation are very much looking into uh, funding uh, science that is shipping related and uh, we have a project that is looking into the environmental uh, impact assessments of the new fuels i know that valerie was talking about the new fuels um, and uh, also the imo is looking of course into the new fuels because this is the way of bringing down the use of the co2 and our research project is looking into but what is the environmental impact of it because many times we're looking into climate solution, which not always benefit the environmental, well, biodiversity and nature. So I think it's important that we are really looking into all the different impacts of the, uh, of climate pollution and biodiversity to see which is the best solution that we can actually come up with to address all three of them at the same time. And I think this is something that we will be working closely on also coming up to the UN Ocean Conference coming up uh, in June next year and also up on, uh, on COP30 to get the ocean up there as a, as a main player on the, uh, on the UN agenda. And we very much as a foundation support uh, the UN processes and all of our grantees in some way or the other is actually working towards the common goals and looking uh, and working towards implementing the different obligations there are on the, the different uh, UN entities, whether it's uh, UNEP decisions, UNEA decisions, whether it's decision under the IMO, whether it's decision under the CBD. We are really much trying as a foundation to complement 
and contribute to the UN agenda. I want to stop there by thanking everyone on the panel and hoping that what uh, Abdella from uh, the IPCC Secretariat said, that we welcome every thought there is on how we can actually work together and bridging the gap between uh, the triple crisis and also uh, including cooperation between philanthropy so we all have the same aim of supporting the UN processes. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Charlotte, to remind us that we never, uh, we never can forget the need to integrate any kind of solution with uh, the triple crisis and the UN process. Now we are going um, to give the floor to Jean-Christophe Martin, who is Professor of International Law at Université Côte d'Azur. Uh, he is also the director of the Institute for Peace and Development of UNICA and holds the UNESCO Chair of Peace and Development through law. Jean-Christophe mainly works on questions relating to peace and security, law of the sea and protection of the environment. He, also, he has also been Vice President for International Affairs of UNICA, Université Côte d'Azur, and he is still interested in science diplomacy, diplomacy issues. He is involved in the definition and implementation of the science diplomacy strategy of university and, for instance, participates in the delegation of universities to the UNF C COP since 2022. Inside Université Côte d'Azur, he is involved in many multidisciplinary initiatives and structure. He also contributes actively to the external relation of university through many collaborations at the national and international plan with various university, NGO, and international institutions. Jean-Christophe, you are very, very welcome. Thank you very much for this introduction, Patricia. This is an honor to be here in this panel. Thank you for having me. I will give you um, a global overview uh, of this problematic chipping and climate addressing the triple planetary crisis through an international law approach. This is a broad overview. Um, my aim here is to present how international law is being developed to face, the, to face the triple crisis of climate change, natural and biodiversity loss, and of course pollution and waste. We have witnessed the progressive development of international law. This is just a brief presentation, but my aim here is to give an insight about the importance of multilateralism, international cooperation in creating new legal frames for um, to regulate activities at sea. Let's start with pollution, B pollution by ships, and I will add some elements to what have been already presented by Simon in his uh, brilliant presentation. Uh, this is all about the IMO work. Uh, just to put the light on the convention that have been uh, adopted in by states in the context of IMO to first of all prevent marine pollution, marine pollution mainly from ships. This is a very successful uh, legal regime. A lot of treaties uh, have been adopted since uh, 1954. For instance, the MARPOL, the so-called MARPOL Convention concerning pollution from ships, adopted in 1973, is now a very powerful legal instrument. And we can say that globally, there is a very large participation of states uh, to all these treaties, and we um, can see that there is a, a strong, good implementation. Uh, the second aspect concerns another problem, uh, liability and compensation in case of oil spills or other uh, major incidents. Uh, here too we can see that international law has been uh, developed uh, through many treaties and we also have a strong legal framework uh, when it comes to um, um, putting the, the, the liability on ship owners uh, to repair all the damages to the marine environment, but also creating international funds for compensation. This is also a very important uh, step in addressing those um, critical questions of the damages to marine environment. I would like just to add something about the, 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 the critical question of pollution of the sea, of the ocean, with plastic. Because um, some very limited uh, rules have been adopted to date 
limited in scope. We have first um, uh, an interesting tool, which is the Annex 5 of the Marpol Convention on Pollution from Ships, which prescribes the rejection at sea from ships of any uh, plastic object. So this is interesting, this is a, a milestone, let's say, but this is very limited in scope uh, when we have in mind uh, the different sources and mainly land-based sources of pollution of the ocean by plastics. And in this respect, we can see that even if theoretically plastics are covered and encompassed uh, by land-based pollution treaties, these treaties do not address specifically this question of plastic and uh, thus are not really efficient uh, about this source of pollution. So there is a kind of legal vacuum uh, concerning this, this, this challenge. Next. Uh, and, and that's why um, I want to uh, remind that uh, there are ongoing negotiations currently uh, to adopt a new global plastics treaty. And the negotiations have started in 2022 in the context of the uh, UN Environmental Assembly. Um, 157 states voted to negotiate, to start negotiating a global treaty on plastics. Um, so the aim of this ne negotiation is to adopt a, an internationally binding uh, instrument containing provisions covering the entire plastics uh, life cycle. So we can hope that it will be it will have a very positive impact on pollution of the ocean uh, with plastics. The, the next session, the fifth session of round of negotiation, um, will uh, be held on uh, in ten days. Next, let's turn to uh, marine biodiversity loss. Uh, here too, we have assessed. Uh, a need to fill a relative, let's say, legal vacuum. Uh, we have uh, in international law a very important uh, international treaty, a uh, famous one called UNCLOS for United Nations Convention on the Law of the Sea, um, whose part number seven is dedicated to ISIS. As you can see, one of the provisions of this uh, constitution of the ocean um, relates to measures for the conservation by state of the living resources on the high seas, and all states must take measures for their respective nationals, for the ship flying their flag, let's say, uh, to uh, conserve through their fishing activities and etc., uh, living resources of the high seas. Based on that, states have adopted a large number, 37, of treaties uh, for regional seas, but also universal treaties concerning identified uh, species. And those treaties institute uh, international fishing commissions, uh, we are, which are entitled to uh, create m binding regulation quotas, but also uh, limitation in fishing techniques, etc. So this is very important when it comes to uh, conservation through uh, sustainable fishing practices. Uh, second element, no, no, no. Second element, we also have important uh, um, developments uh, in the convention, the famous convention on biological diversity in 1992, because it concerned the, the, the conservation of nature, of biodiversity, under the jurisdiction of states, including their territorial waters. So all the provisions of the CBD apply to the maritime territory of states. And this is an important step. And I remind you that uh, this is in the context of this CBD treaty, uh, COP15, that the Kunming Montreal uh, Global Biodiversity Framework has been adopted, um, requesting states to get the 30 by 30 target. Next. So, why do I present the situation as a legal vacuum, a relative legal vi vacuum? Because to date, we do not have a legal framework in force to manage the activities on the ICs. And this is a very important. Uh, issue for the international community. Here, too, I 
put the light on this uh, question because we have witnessed a very important effort from the international community, uh, the adoption of the famous BBNG treaty, Biodiversity Beyond National Jurisdiction, which is dedicated to activities on the ICs and uh, on the deep sea bed, let's say. Um, different uh, questions are addressed in this treaty, but you can see that there is a part number three, which is entirely dedicated to measures such as area-based management tools, including marine protected areas that has been inserted in the treaty. This is a very detailed legal regime concerning the creation of MPAs on the ICs. So, very important um, progress of the international community against a backdrop of geopolitical turmoil. This is a very, you know, rude uh, international geopolitical situation and thus we can see here a very positive element uh, through the, acts, the adoption uh, of this treaty. This is a real success of multilateralism and um, this is also visible in the legal regime of part, of part three since uh, uh, states have decided that they can create collectively MPAs on the ICES not only through a consensual decision, through consensus, but also in case it's not possible through a decision adopted by three-fourths of the states. And this is a very important outcome of the negotiations. Yet. To turn to the, the third crisis, the climate crisis and shipping, uh, what about air pollution by ships? Just many things have already been said. Just a, a reminder here, the MARPOL uh, convention uh, is also uh, encompassing this question through annex number six, dedicated to prevention of air pollution from ships, which entered into force in May uh, 2005. And um, this is very uh, an important framework since uh, this Annex 6 set limits on sulfur oxide and nitrogen oxide emissions uh, from ships and designate emission control areas. In, uh, based on that, the IMO has adopted, so I mean states inside the IMO have collectively adopted two very interest, interesting regulations, number 13 dedicated to nitrogen oxides and regulation 14 uh, on sulfur oxide and um, particulate matter, which are setting limits for the fuel used by ships. And based on that, uh, uh, many sulfur, not, not that much to be honest, <laughs> when I say many, this is maybe too and big, um, too, too positive, but um, five sulfur emission control areas have been set up, as well as four nitrogen emission control areas. I'll talk about that because this is the legal international framework for all the regulation concerning shipping and emissions. Uh, next. Uh, I talk about that because I try to give you very positive examples of what's going on and to see the, the, the best of the international community progress. Uh, a, a new zone, a new SECA uh, will be um, into force in May 2025 concerning the Mediterranean Sea. Um, the Barcelona Convention COP has decided to create such uh, an area, a SICA area, and it has been uh, validated by IMO in 2022. So this is very good news for us in Monaco, in Nice, but for the entire uh, world. Uh, we will have a new SICA zone. You can see that this is just the beginning of a, 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 a process that will be um, virtuous that will be very positive <laughs> for the, the, the international community. And just to, to, to end the presentation, uh, so use of renewable and low carbon fuels in maritime transport is one of the best or um, privileged measure to fight um, the climate crisis. Uh, it raises questions about implementation, compliance, monitoring, but you can see that there are already very important steps. Uh, for instance, this regulation adopted by EU 
uh, in 2023 on the use of renewable and low carbon fuels in marine tra transport. Um, but also we have talked about vessels, speed reduction, other technical um, proposals such as bubbles, bows placed on at the front of the ship. As you have explained, there is room for innovation and shipping in the face of climate change, but even if there is a margin of progress, I wanted to just see also what is very positive and all the steps that <laughs> have already been uh, reached. So thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Jean-Christophe. We always learn a lot when, when you make your explanation and we already have a lot of questions for you about that. Now I'm going to give the floor to Jan Pashner, the Secretary General of the One Ocean Foundation and very welcome, Emily. Jan Pashner is the Secretary General of the One, Fun One Ocean Foundation, I already said that, an international profit organization based out of Italy, dedicated to marine environment preservation since 2018. Born in Austria, he began his career in international hotel management and in 2007 spearheaded the international development of the Yacht Club Costa Esmeralda. In 2017, he led the successful organization of the two-day One Ocean Forum in Milan, contributing to the establishment of the One Ocean Foundation. Since then, Jan Pachner has played a key role in growing the foundation's international network, activities and credibility as an authority promoting the blue economy. Millstone, such as the Scientific Research Publication Business for Ocean Sustainability Report, as well as Ocean Disclosure Initiative, the first rating framework dedicated to industry impact on the ocean and environment, are just a few of the latest accomplishments. Jan, you are very welcome. Thanks very much, Patricia. Thank you very much for the, for the invite and uh, honor to be here on this panel. Um, a lot has been already said, so I don't want to sort of uh, double on, uh, um, on, on many of the facts that are out there. I just uh, would like to highlight that um, uh, in our, uh, one of our latest reports that we have issued, it's, it's a public report available on our, on our site um, of the Foundation One Ocean uh, Foundation, um, is on the shipping industry as well, and so um, shipping in ports. And so um, I had the honor also to be uh, working with uh, Nathalie in Monaco on the document on the blue economy that was presented earlier. So um, just a couple of points that I think um, maybe that are worth to be uh, mentioned um, that maybe are additional uh, points that maybe we can we can work on and not not uh, not forget about it when we talk about fishing and impact um, on the environment. Um, one is uh, on um, the emissions. Um, we've seen, I think it was the first presentation of the slides, uh, what happens in many ports or also in front of Suez Canal or in uh, uh, Panama when basically you have a lot of these um, cargo ships and, um, and uh, tankers waiting for their turn basically to go through. This has a huge impact also on emissions and also on seafloor integrity because if they um, have to wait in front of port to be called in, they keep their engines going um, and uh, they drop their anchors. And uh, many times this is a bit, uh, um, we don't put probably enough uh, attention on uh, what that does to the seafloor integrity, especially in these areas. And so I think this is another uh, point to mention um, that has not really been addressed so far. Uh, another um, thing is also the ship strikes. I know we've talked about it um, a bit before, but I think um, there was an interesting comment that came out, I think also in Monaco we talked about it, in, uh, in terms of insurance, um, how different industries maybe can work together. And this opens up another discussion point when you talk about natural capital. And, and the importance of um, sea mammals as natural capital. And eventually we could open up discussion with uh, uh, insurers if they realize and if, they can, uh, if we can make that point that um, ship strikes have actually also an Im economic impact on, on, on natural capital, for example, on, on, on sea mammals. Um, all these vessels um, are insured. So if, if insurers could actually obtain uh, a lower premium for 
um, shipping companies that, uh, for example, install on their vessels certain technical mechanisms to avoid ships uh, to avoid these ship strike on sea mammals, or um, reduce their speed or change their um, shipping patterns, they should actually pay uh, less premium, less insurance premium, because they are avoiding um, this damage on, on natural capital. So I think that's another point that we should um, that, that uh, we should highlight. And um, well, waste treatment obviously on um, I think there's a big responsibility. We've been talking a lot about ships, but I think also on land uh, responsibility on on the port side um, to provide solutions on um, on waste treatment um, that many times unfortunately is not that uh, well handled and also on um, the infrastructures when we talk about energy um, so we can avoid also their uh, emissions and I think the port side has, has their responsibility as well you know to get that um, um, you know to have their infrastructures in place so I think these were just a couple of points um, that I wanted to highlight um, and maybe uh, it's worthwhile to add that on the list Thank you. Jan, thank you very much for this. And now, thank you, Emily, for coming. We know that you are jumping from one place to another. So I'm just going to introduce Emily Kelly from the World Economic Forum's Ocean Action. Uh, she's, she pro she's a program lead in the World Economic Forum's Ocean Action Agenda, which aims to create innovative platforms at the nexus of science, business, and policy and cultivate partnership across business, government, academia, and civil society to fast track ambitious solutions for ocean health. The OEA team does this by supporting industry transition toward nature positive operation, getting investment into marine and coastal ecosystem, fostering an ecosystem on ocean innovation enabled by financial opportunities. Emily led the Blue Carbon Action Partnership where she drives collaborative efforts to protect and restore coastal blue carbon ecosystem, contributed to local livelihoods, biodiversity and climate goal. Thank you very much to be here. Thank you so much. I really apologize for my tardiness. I thought I was being early and then um, my calendar I, it must have been a time zone issue when i inputted everything into my calendar so anyway i'm so pleased to join you all and really apologize for for being delayed i have the benefit of actually not knowing all of the pieces and so i will share some perhaps a bit redundantly um, but hopefully continuing to build off what colleagues have already shared um, and um, yeah thank you again so pleased to be here um, so just commenting on um, the fact that over half of world GDP, or 44 trillion US dollars, depend on nature. And within the Ocean Action Agenda, we're thinking about um, how can corporates take action for a nature positive world. And um, I'm going to highlight today just some of the work that we're doing, um, building off of Jan's discussion of ports and um, some of the work that the World Economic Forum is doing in this space. Um, so the transition towards an economy that's compatible with nature and climate is needed and, and it's happening um, both on land and in the ocean and all industries have specific impacts on nature along the entire value chain but they also have dependencies on nature without clean functioning water systems and stable supply of natural resources for example many industries will be unable to operate. Meanwhile, we must ensure that new nature-related business opportunities and innovation result in the creation of new jobs and benefits for local communities. Despite the increased momentum of nature over recent years, not enough is being done, with 83% 80 of Fortune 500 companies um, having climate change. Only 25% have freshwater consumption targets. 5% have targets for biodiversity loss and only 5% of companies have assessed their impact on nature with less than 1% understanding their dependencies. So with all of that being said, the marine sectors, including ports and shipping that we're talking about today, are going to be critical in carbon neutrality, in our carbon neutrality future. And we need to ensure that the transition is responsible and sensitive to its impacts on both land and marine species and even contributes to restoring degraded ecosystems. Given the growing volume of global trade and the potential of increasing impacts on nature, it's crucial for the two sectors to take action 
and transform operations and value chains to contribute to nature positive global goals. So international organizations and governments have long recognized the importance of mitigating environmental impacts such as pollution and greenhouse gas emissions from both shipping and ports. But less focus internationally has been on ports and port operations than on shipping, given that ports are not internationally governed. So the work that we're doing in the World Economic, World Economic Forum is in collaboration with Lloyd's Register Foundation and the China Oceanic Development Foundation. The forum's ocean team, in collaboration with the industrial clusters team, is planning to produce a new report entitled Nature Poli Positive, the Role of Ports, to draw greater attention from actors in the port sector to nature-related impact and dependencies, and provide more detailed analysis, <coughs> such as opportunity sizing and case studies to jointly explore the sector's nature-positive transition pathways. And I have to say that this is a bit of a teaser right now, where um, this report is about to come out during our annual meeting in Davos in January. And so I would love to share with all of you when that report is released, more details, um, but to say right now that, that it is in the finalizing stages and please stay tuned for, for its release. Emily, for your intervention, and we are waiting obviously for this key report. And now we have a last intervention of Herrick from the Velux Funden. I don't know if we have his video, Karen. Is the video ready? Yes, it's ready. Just, I'm going to introduce him first, maybe. So, Hendrik Oxfeld Enenvoldsen. He's the head of Ocean Science Section EOC, um, Mean Science and Communication Center of Harmful Algae at University of Copenhagen, Denmark. He's the technical secretary for the EOC Intergovernmental Panel on Harmful Algal Bloom. He's the EOC focal point for EOC's core global lab. Nutrient pollution, microplastic oceans, and human health issue. Are we ready with the ocean? Okay. We cannot hear. Okay, so let let us know if it's gonna get better in order to start the, the conversation first. Let's try again. No, it's not working. Well, and if you switch off and then switch on again. Huh? Okay, so let, let's have a conversation. I took a lot of uh, comments here during all your intervention. Let me find again my document, yes. And I have a word in my mind and it's efficiency. Efficiency in economy, when you mention Valerie, uh, the problem of the price, uh, and, and, and even if we have a kind of a certification of capture car carbon of diminution of, or diminution of carbon emission, who is gonna get paid from that? Then when you talk, Sean Christophe, about this vacuum, this legal vacuum, I also have in mind uh, this, <laughs> this word, <laughs> efficiency. And we already discussed about that. Uh, if you remember, in Monaco, we have a lot of legislation, regulation that are completely necessary, but at the same time, we understand that um, the multilateralism follow the same path uh, like countries. And if in a single country, we already have a lot of problem to develop, integrate, Public, uh, public policy, you can imagine what happened at the international level. And I guess that the same happened in the relationship port and shipping and cities, you know. We need to integrate and understand the ocean, not only from the shipping perspective, but only uh, also considering the port and shipping. So I wish to, to have your, I, I only come back to that first problem, this way to understand the public policy and this manner that we have to separate everything and that is attempting against uh, an integrated solution for this. 
No, thank you, Patricia. I think this is at the heart of the triple environmental crisis, which is actually a triple economic crisis, much more than it is an environmental crisis in many ways. Um, it's the fact that the way we produce and consume sacrifices green, clean, and inclusive development on the altar of efficiency. That's why regulation goes down. It's why externalities go up and trade-offs go up. And I think it's one of the discussions I was so interested to see and um, the comment about the best government is the government that governs the least. The challenge is when that happens, you deregulate. And when you deregulate, you tend to leave out either the poorest communities, the poorer countries, or the voiceless, including, for example, biodiversity. Because if you don't have regulations against ship strikes, for example, then why would companies not strike ships? And so it is this interesting balance, and I think this is always the tension. It's in the negotiating rooms right here. It's the tension around how much regulation is important to ensure that nobody is left behind and nature isn't destroyed and emissions don't increase without stopping the jobs and development and growth agenda that is so important without scaring away private sector. And there is no right or wrong answer, but I think efficiency cannot be the only goal. We have to look at making sure there are other social goals that are equally important and then find the right balance in every country, every community, and every company has to decide that balance. Mm, thank you. So the question you, you ask about international law and efficiency, let's say, uh, relates to two different problems. The first one is the legal vacuum, the holes in the international legal framework. In this respect, um, I wanted to put the light on vacuums that are to be uh, fixed um, because we have two very important examples of efforts from the international community. The first one is the BBNG Treaty concerning sustainable use of marine resources beyond national jurisdiction, a very important uh, step, a milestone. Um, the second example is the Global Treaty on Plastics. If the negotiation succeed, we will then have a, a strong legal framework. So the vacuum thing will always exist, but we are progressively um, fixing this, this problem. And we can see that even in very difficult international geopolitical context, states are aware of the, 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 the common problems they face. and try to find good legal solutions and in the field of ocean regulation uh, maritime activities regulation we have very good examples of successes of multilateralism uh, collective action cooperation between states uh, the second part of your question relates uh, actually uh, um, to implementation we can have robust uh, international legal framework, but if there is no uh, implementation, effective implementation by actors uh, at sea, it will be useless. Uh, in this respect, um, this respect is very uh, raises very difficult questions since it is quite difficult for states to uh, perform efficient enforcement activities at sea. It's very difficult to control all the activities, the human activities in very large areas at sea, sometimes very far from the shore, because we have to keep in mind that the main jurisdiction of states uh, concerning activities at sea is the, flag, is the flag state jurisdiction, which means that the flag state must control the activities and as an exclusive duty and jurisdiction to control the activities performed by ships on the high seas. So this is uh, uh, an enormous challenge when it comes to enforcement. But um, states have also decided to face this problem in creating new legal regimes. And I create a link with the port question. We have created in international law, for instance, a new jurisdiction. This is not that new, it has been created some decades ago, but the so-called port state jurisdiction, which is very important, for instance, uh, when it comes to illegal or unregulated uh, fishing in, uh, on the high seas, 
we have developed this port state approach, which means that ships that are suspected of having illegally fished in international waters can be controlled by the states in whose ports they enter. States can refuse the entrance in the port, but also can admit the entrance in the port and then control ships. This is just an example to once again uh, trying try to be positive concerning the development of international law, which means the, the engagement of states in facing those problems. A little bit long, but quite complete answer. Maybe I'll just add um, one brief bit onto the regulation side of things, um, because I think that's such an interesting piece of uh, the challenge. Um, just to say that um, as we're working with corporates and governments, thinking um, uh, about nature positive actions, one of the things that we hope is possible is a race to the top. Race to the top. Um, and that can be enabled by uh, having policy and regulation that helps to drive capital into those that are at the top. Um, and so there is a role that can be played there um, that can be very supportive from the interaction between what companies are looking to do, those that are really um, striving for best practices, and then how government might support continuing that really um, uh, nature positive behavior. Here, Van Brick is ready. Well, not yet, not yet. Unfortunately, we will not be able to play it now. And maybe, I don't know, I, w I wish to open the floor to the public if you have some questions. Yes, of course. Valérie Antol, nice to meet you. Uh, just to add something, there's another agreement that has been adopted lately in 2022, which is the w WTO Fishery Agreement, Fishery Subsidies Agreement, which is directly involving ships. That's it. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, so someone want to react to that or someone else want to add something? Okay. So thank you very much to all of you. It has been a very, very interesting panel. You can find it in uh, www.fcs.tv. There is Simon. Ah, oh, Simon. Simon, who is there? Who want to talk? Simon, are you there? Can we hear you? Can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you, and, and I'm pleased to be involved in the conversation. Yes, just, just a few, just a few comments on on the previous comments. Uh, it's an interesting balance between the legal side and the operational side because if you think about a, a ship strike, a whale strike, it does actually cause damage to the ship, and it can cause significant damage. And then there's also the, the kind of PR side of having a, a whale on your, on your bulbous bow, if, particularly if you're a, a cruise vessel. So the, part, part of my presentation was, was to bring measures together. So if you look at a, uh, an activity like slow steaming, for instance, or, or a ship's efficiency plan, then in areas it, a ship would slow down. If you could combine that with good data for whales, it's all, it's all about data, where the whales are, real time, etc. then you could combine a lot of these things together and, and that's kind of the win-win-wins that I was trying to exemplify in my presentation and then may, maybe just a, a comment to Valerie's original comment about the lack of availability of, of green fuels at the moment I, I, I do I do agree and, and that requires a, a lot of funding and a lot of development a lot of our D&D &D. but we can make brilliant savings great savings 30 to 40 percent on vessels just by efficiency measures uh, in terms of greenhouse gas emissions up until 2030. So there's a kind of a hierarchy of this transition that we have to go through. And, and the development of fuel has, has a wee bit longer because you can still hit a lot of these targets initially with ship's efficiency. And that's why I keep talking about ship's efficiency because I think this is a way of, of uh, these win, creating these win-win situations. Thank you. I hear you first. I don't know if someone wants to react to what Simon said. Okay, and Charlotte, do you want to add something? I cannot hear Charlotte, I don't know if she's here. Well, thank you everyone to be there. We are going to close this panel and, and let the floor to the next one. Thank you everyone.